there's two issues here. There's a sort of empirical one and a philosophical one. I don't think there's anything in principle that stops machines from being conscious. I'll give you a little demonstration of that before we carry on. Mm -hmm. Suppose I take your brain and I take one brain cell in your brain and I replace it by, it's a bit black mirror-like, I replace it by a little piece of nanotechnology that's just the same size that behaves in exactly the same way when it gets pings from other neurons. It sends out pings just as the brain cell would have. So the other neurons don't know anything's changed. Okay, I've just replaced one of your brain cells with this little piece of nanotechnology. Would you still be conscious? Yeah. Now you can see where this argument's going. Yeah, so if you replaced all of them. As I replace them all, at what point do you stop being conscious? Well, people think of consciousness as this, like, ethereal thing that exists maybe beyond the brain cells. Yeah, well, people have a lot of crazy ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, people don't know what consciousness is, and they often don't know what they mean by it. Mm. And then they fall back on saying, well, I know it because I've got it, and I can see that I've got it. And they fall back on this theatre model of the mind, which I think is nonsense. What do you think of consciousness as, if you had to try and define it? Is it Because I think of it as just like the awareness of myself, I don't know. I think it's a term we'll stop using. Suppose you want to understand how a car works. Well, you know some cars have a lot of oomph and other cars have a lot less oomph. Like an Aston Martin's got lots of oomph mm. and a little Toyota Corolla doesn't have much oomph. But oomph isn't a very good concept for understanding cars. Um, if you want to understand cars, you need to understand about electric engines or petrol engines and how they work. Mm. And it gives rise to oomph. But oomph isn't a very useful explanatory concept. It's a kind of essence of a car. It's the essence of an Aston Martin. Mm. But it doesn't explain much. I think consciousness is like that. And I think we'll stop using that term. But I don't think there's anything, any reason why a machine shouldn't have it. If your view of consciousness is that it intrinsically involves self-awareness, then the machine's got to have self-awareness. It's got to have cognition about its own cognition and stuff. But... I'm a materialist through and through, mm -hmm. and I don't think there's any reason why a machine shouldn't have consciousness. Do you think they do, then, have the same consciousness that we think of ourselves as being uniquely uh, given as a gift when we're born? I'm ambivalent about that at present. So I don't think there's this hard line. I think as soon as you have a machine that has some self-awareness, it's got some consciousness. Um, I think it's an emergent property of a complex system. It's not a sort of essence that's throughout the universe. It's you make this really complicated system that's complicated enough to have a model of itself, and it does perception. And I think then you're beginning to get a, a conscious machine. So I don't think there's any sharp distinction between what we've got now and conscious machines. I don't think it's going to, one day we're going to wake up and say, hey, if you put this special chemical in, it becomes conscious. It's not going to be like that. I think we all wonder if these computers are like thinking like we are on their own when we're not there. And if they're experiencing emotions, if they're contending with, I, we, I think we probably, you know, we think about things like love and things that are, feel unique to biological species. Um, are they sat there thinking? Are they, are, do they have concerns? I, I think they really are thinking. And I think as soon as you make AI agents, they will have concerns. If you wanted to make an effective AI agent, suppose you, let's take a call center. Mm -hmm. In a call center, you have people at present. They have all sorts of emotions and feelings, which are kind of useful. So suppose I call up the call center and I'm actually lonely and I don't actually want to know the answer to why my computer isn't working. I just want somebody to talk to. After a while, the person in the call centre will either get bored or get annoyed with me <laughs> and will terminate it. Well, you replace them by an AI agent. The AI agent needs to have the same kind of responses. If someone's just called up because they just want to talk to the AI agent and we're happy to talk for whole, the whole day to the AI agent, that's not good for business. And you want an AI agent that either gets bored or gets irritated and says, I'm sorry, but I don't have time for this. And <laughs> once it does that... I think it's got emotions. Now, like I say, emotions have two aspects to them. There's the cognitive aspect and the behavioral aspect, and then there's a the physiological aspect. And these go together with us. Mm -hmm. And if the AI agent gets embarrassed, it won't go red. 
Yeah. Um, so there's no physiological... And skin won't start sweating. Yeah. But it might have all the same behaviour. And in that case, I'd say, yeah, it's having emotion. It's got an emotion. So it's going to have the same sort of cognitive thought, and then yeah. it's going to act upon that cognitive in thought. In the same way, but without the physiological responses. And does that matter? That it doesn't go red in the face and it's just a different... I mean, that's a response to the... It makes it somewhat different from us. Yeah. For some things, the physiological aspects are very important, like love. They're a long way from having love the same way we do. But I don't see why they shouldn't have emotions. So I think what's happened is people have a model of how the mind works and what feelings are and what emotions are, and their model is just wrong. What, um, what brought you to Google? You, you worked um, at Google for about a decade, right? Yeah. What brought you there? I have a son who has learning difficulties. And in order to be sure he would never be out on the street, I needed to get several million dollars. And I wasn't going to get that as an academic. I tried. So I taught a Coursera course in the hope that I'd make lots of money that way, but there was no money in that. Mm -hmm. So I figured out, well, the only way to get millions of dollars is to sell myself to a big company. And so when I was 65, fortunately for me, I had two brilliant students who produced something called AlexNet, which was a neural net that was very good at recognizing objects and images. And so Ilya and Alex and I set up a little company and auctioned it. And we actually set up an auction where we had a number of big companies bidding for us. And that company was called AlexNet? No, the, the, the network that recognized objects was called AlexNet. The company was called DNN Research, Deep Neural Network Research. And it was doing things like this. I'll put this uh, yeah, graph up on the that's screen. Yeah, that's AlexNet. This picture shows eight images, and AlexNet's ability, which is your company's ability, to spot what was in those images. Yeah. So it could tell the difference between various kinds of mushroom. And about 12% of ImageNet is dogs. <laughs> and to be good at ImageNet, you have to tell the difference between very similar kinds of dog. And it would got to be very good at that. And um, your, your company, AlexNet, won several awards, I believe, for its ability to outperf outperform its competitors. And so Google ultimately ended up acquiring your technology. Google acquired that technology and some other technology. And you went to work at Google at age, what, 66? I went at age 65 to work at Google. 65. And you left at age 76? 75. 75, okay. I worked there for more or less exactly 10 years. And what were you doing there? Okay, they were very nice to me. They said, they said pretty much you can do what you like. I worked on something called distillation that did really work well. And that's now used all the time. In AI. In AI, and distillation is a way of taking what a big model knows, a big neural net knows, and getting that knowledge into a small neural net. Then at the end, I got very interested in analog computation and whether it would be possible to get these big language models running in analog hardware so they used much less energy. Mm -hmm. And it was while I was doing that work that I began to really realize how much better digital is for sharing information. Was there a eureka moment? There was a eureka month or two, um, and it was a sort of coupling of ChatGPT coming out, although Google had very similar things a year earlier, and I'd seen those, and that had a big effect on me. The closest I had to a eureka moment was when a Google system <laughs> called Palm was able to say why a joke was funny. And I'd always thought of that as a kind of landmark. If it can say why a joke's funny, it really does understand. Mm. And it could say why a joke was funny. <laughs> and that coupled with realizing why digital is so much better than analog for sharing information suddenly made me very interested in AI safety and that these things were going to get a lot smarter than us. Why did you leave Google? <laughs> 